Coming up, we explain why the Brooklyn Nets cannot afford to overpay Cam Johnson this summer at any cost. We'll break it all down next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. Over there, you're going to find Doug Norrie. He's the owner-operator of DFSR for all your daily fantasy sports rankings. From DraftKings to FanDuel, he's got you covered. I'm Adam Armbrecht, breaking down the New York football giants and the New Jersey Devils on a couple of podcasts that you can go find. We thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We're free on all those great platforms and let you know. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash NBA. And when you enter promo code locked on NBA, they'll throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. And Doug, as the offseason continues here, and we know the draft is a little bit less than one month away, the Brooklyn Nets have other big decisions to make, specifically when it comes to one Cameron Johnson, the offseason contract that we all assume the Nets are ready and willing to pay, except for this wrinkle of what if other teams come to the table with big offers, you and I are now asking ourselves the difficult question, should the Nets draw a line in the sand on what they're willing to pay Cam Johnson? Yeah, coming off your conversation and then the conversation I had with Jackson Gatlin from Locked on Rockets the other day, along with some other just NBA reporting that's come out here over the last couple of days around you know starting to these little trial balloons around team interests and stuff, uh, Cameron Johnson's name is being floated a lot more with the idea that there probably is a – possibly a robust market for his services here in the off season. And that's could get really dicey for the nets in terms of how expensive he could get. Um, and I have to say right now, like this is just to me, and we're getting to all the reasons why, and maybe you agree or disagree, but to me, this is just like the exact guy you do not want to go crazy overpay for <laughs> um, just because he represents something else for the organization or because you maybe overvalue his skills. So we'll get into all the reasons why, but this could be setting up for a situation that puts the nets in a really dicey predicament in terms of like the kind of player that you go all the way up the salary chain for. And as good as I think Cameron Johnson is, I just don't think he's that player. Yeah, it's interesting because, and I think he's listed on a lot of various outlets among the top 10 free agents on the market. Now you can look yep. at that and say it's indicative of his talent or maybe of a thin market, relatively speaking, for unrestricted free agents. That being the case, though, it's funny, man. I, I like Cam Johnson. I like his game. I like him as a compliment to some other things that you try to do here. But to your point, and I guess I'll, I'll put it this way, we'll discuss what the number is that you can't go beyond if you're the Nets. But I don't think you can afford to overpay him this offseason, knowing that even though Ben Simmons' money is going to come off the books here in another year, at you know, at worst, another two seasons from now, you have Nicholas Claxton's contract coming up. You have to figure out what happens with Joe Harris. You have some veterans. There's moves that can get made here. But in spite of trading away the superstars, the Nets are still in a difficult cap situation. So there's the world where if you overpay Cam Johnson, you extend the timeline of getting out from underneath some of these issues. And I think that that's the biggest component for me of overpaying Cam Johnson and having it come back to bite you. It's that if it doesn't work out, you know exactly the picture that you could be in two or three years from now. Yeah. So right now the nets are sitting like around 10 million below the luxury tax line, like give or take going into next season. Um, the reports are just on a bare level. It looks like, Cameron Johnson is is looking for, I mean, maybe something in that four year, 90 million range, possibly higher. And if the Bears a bidding war that starts, uh, we could be looking at a different situation. He is a restricted free agent. So the Nets have the ability to match any offer mm -hmm. that comes in. Um, you know, we were in the, the Nets were in this situation last year with like some other guys too, like, you know, Claxton and what, whatnot, where it just worked out and they were able to bring these guys back. It looks like the market for, for CJ here is going to be more, like I said, more robust. And if you have a team like the Rockets who are not dealing with anything like the salary cap considerations that the Nets have right now, um, you know, they have lots of money to kind of spend with, even if they were to bring in James Harden, like they are um, pretty light on cap holds. So the, 
the, it could look like a situation. I mean, twenty five million a year or something like that for Cameron Johnson, and that would be, start to be represent like a pretty big mistake, I think. Um, just in terms of like where you tie your money, because like you said, the Nets have not they have money on the books already. Like the, the Ben Simmons contract is on the books. Like they Mikhail Bridges contract's amazing. Like that, but you know, it's still, it's still money. Um, and you know, I never complain about that one at all. You do have other guys that you might want to look to sign like, or resign like Claxton here going out into the future, or you might want to position yourself. And this might be the most important part. You might want to position yourself for free agent classes or unhappy guys that come up in a few years, right. That like right. still line up with the timeline. And that's where the Cameron Johnson thing can get really tricky because if you tie, if you start tying 20, 25 million, something like that to a guy for four years here, because that's where he's getting on the market. You are committing to that player for a long period of time or hoping that you can go like 75 cents on the dollar to trade him later, which is not where you want to be either, <laughs> either with a guy. And so I just think that like where they stand with Johnson right now, I get all the different considerations about why you would want to do it. And I think there are plenty of like sort of even non-basketball, like non-on-court reasons that they would they would really start thinking about it. I wonder if actually that factors for them more than anything else. But man, it like heading into a really stringent salary cap structure coming here in future years, combined with the kind of players that we know you should spend the most for, as opposed to like guys you maybe shouldn't get stuck paying a lot for like this is really tricky man i like i i don't know like i we i have a bunch of different reasons we can go back and forth but the about like sort of like the yeses and the nos part of this but my gut feeling on it and i'd be interested to hear your gut before we get into some of like the nitty-gritty here is to be like hey man sometimes you just gotta let it go <laughs> you know like if the number gets too high it's just okay. <laughs> like, well, and we can all have a consolation thing later, but like, I don't know. Well, it's interesting, right? So there's, there's uh, the two things that come to mind is one that uh, I was reminiscent of Alan Crabb years ago when the nets were wheeling and dealing and taking in contracts. One of the other fun things they did was kind of throw out death nail offers for players that were restricted free agents. And then their teams would have to match and you'd actually be doing damage to others until the team doesn't match. And then the Nets ended up taking on Alan Crabb. It was 19, I think 20 million around there at the time. And it was a brutal contract after the first year where he had a decent performance and then went downhill from there. And it was a mess, right? So, you know, is, is CJ Alan Crabb? No, you know, there's certainly more there to his game, obviously. But that's that idea of like restricting yourself in that way. The one, the one caveat that I'll give is adding into the idea of, you know that Ben Simmons' money is coming off the books, you know that Joe Harris's money at worst is coming off the books in a year, you know that you can move on from $13 million with DFS, that you can move on from north of $9 million with a Royce O'Neal. Like, there's a lot of money here. The fact that their, their cap situation is a little bit wonky after the superstar era, to say the least, there is the world where two years from now, the only guys that you're paying 20 to $25 million are Bridges, Johnson, and Claxton. And if that's the case, is that a, you know, su is that a superstar NBA championship level team? No, but the rest of your roster will be hopefully filled out with young draft picks and young talent and some veteran guys on reasonable contracts, right? So I think you can paint a slightly less gloomy picture of, of how damning it could be to sign them. And it doesn't change the fact, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a second, the reasons why you shouldn't overpay them, right? It can be okay to do it. It doesn't mean that it's the right decision ultimately. And I have another big factor why they may want to avoid this as well that we'll discuss. All right, before we get to that, got to tell you about our friends over at Bird Dogs. Look, if I stood up right now, uh, you would see that I'm rocking the Bird Dogs on the legs right this second. That's because ever since Bird Dogs came in the mail, which was about two weeks ago, I would I would estimate my non bird dogs time in these shorts at about like 15%. And that like includes showers. And that includes like, you know, it's just some general how to get a, give them a wash here every once in a while. These are the absolute best shorts you could ever hope to imagine in terms of just quality. The stretchiness fits perfectly. They have the interior lining, which makes them really, really comfortable. They're super versatile. Like Adam and I both live at the beach. I know these things can go down to the water, into the water, out of the water and go about the rest of your day. And you're going to feel pretty good about it. I really can't overstate this enough they are the most comfortable shorts i've ever worn point stop the two pairs i have now 
are only going to be added when it comes to <laughs> grabbing some more of these because this is basically all I'm going to be doing for the rest of my summer 10 days. If you are into bird dogs, you have to, if you are into bird dogs, you have to start getting into it now. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on MBA, enter the promo code locked on MBA, just like our channel. And they're going to throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. You're not getting better deals from this. You are not getting better shorts than this. Go to birddogs.com right now. Birddogs.com slash locked on MBA. Throw in that pro promo code locked on MBA. Grab the Yeti style tumbler. Grab yourself a pair of shorts. You will not regret it. Okay. So before we talk about some of the statistical elements around what CJ, what Cam Johnson's game is and whether or not it's worth paying X amount for, I'll give one last caveat here. And that's just on Mikhail Bridges and where his contract is. It is a very team-friendly deal, and that's awesome. And I'm not saying that Mikhail Bridges has an ego around the idea of Cam Johnson making as much or maybe slightly more than him, but there is that world where on the market, Cameron Johnson gets offered something that comes right up next to or maybe even a little bit beyond Mikhail Bridges' contract over these next few seasons. And the reason that I think it'd be more concerning even than saying, Mikhail and his personality and his friendship with Johnson might fall into the category of, yeah, I want this guy to make as much as me. I want us to be partners in this. But the other way it goes is Mikhail brings a couple of years from now when his game's in his prime, he says, you know what? I wouldn't mind is go ahead and give me a little pay raise over the last couple of years of this deal. And I, so that's the element of this where it's like all of a sudden more than one thing can start escalating around it. And I think symbolically, like the Brooklyn Nets organization might look at that and say, we do want to have Mikhail feel like he's the best player on this team and rewarded as such. Now, Bridges has given great interviews, pushing off every sentiment around yeah. him being the superstar and the leader of the team. So I think it's about as far from a concern as you can get. But it is just a reality, right? Like two years from now, when all of a sudden you have to pay Mikhail a little more justifiably and Nick Claxton's on the books, then the numbers do get a little bit bigger. And it's just something worth noting here when potentially Cameron Johnson could get a contract that is more than what Mikhail Bridges makes over the next few seasons. Yeah, I mean, he's going to probably press into the same territory for sure. I'm not too worried about that part. Bridges has been like as great as you could possibly hope a guy could be in terms of like a mouthpiece for an organization. I get why they would not even want to entertain huge package offers for him because this is just like, it seems very anti big three in terms of just what, what <laughs> how, you know, in terms of how, and actually in, in terms of Cameron Johnson, like to some degree, like that is one of the reasons you think about bringing him back is if you really value bridges as a, as a, as a hardcore, just necessary piece for your rebuild going forward. They are basically best friends. They call themselves the twins. Like they seemed like in complete lockstep. I actually think that when I said at the beginning, there's like non-basketball stuff that's, sort of a part of this i think that is actually part of it is that like they're such good friends that i don't think the nets would even i think the nets would value that to be a certain number right like they would value that to say like this is worth a few million extra dollars like that because we want to just keep these guys really happy I, I don't think that's always the best business decision but i think that i sometimes maybe do a bad job of rating that properly right <laughs> like in terms of what that means for a team one other thing too, that I want to, that I want to ask you about. Do you think that I, I know it should not be a one to one? It should be the clear cut basketball basketball business. What it means, what the value is, and paying him the right contract for CJ. But I assume as well that the fact that Mikhail Bridges is on such a team friendly deal maybe will influence the organization about how they feel about spending a little more somewhere else, right? Because you could paint a very easy picture that Mikhail Bridges should be making thirty million. And, you know, and then maybe more right based on what he does in the upcoming season. So there's a world where you are getting value on his contract and, and that value is only going to increase. You're not supposed to do bookkeeping this way, but I think that the Brooklyn Nets can do bookkeeping this way where they go. Yeah, we're overpaying Cam Johnson four million a year. But we're underpaying Mikael Bridges almost ten million a year. So yeah, but what if you're okay paying overpaying Ben time. Simmons by th well, you're overpaying Ben Simmons by thirty five million a year? So right. like, and, then, so we, I'm not and sure. then we do the you're underpaying <laughs> Nicholas Claxton by like ten or twelve. Ah, right. so, it just all comes out of the wash. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So okay, so here, okay, let me. So I think those are the reasons. Like that's actually a, a reason to, to keeping him right. Um, yes. And it's a non basketball reason, but I think it's a real thing, and I actually think it's part of how the Nets are thinking these days. I, I think they're thinking this like sort of team oriented culture. Um, 
element that they feel like that maybe that that, that rope got let go here for a few years and they want to just kind of claw <laughs> some of it back. Right. I, I get it. I look, I, I get how this sort of um, ends up these kind of things end up fostering in terms of like how you want to make organizational decisions. I also think too, and I'll make, I'm going to quickly make the case for like this, the, the, the CJ piece here. Yeah. I think they see him or why the Nets would want to do it. I've talked about this on multiple podcasts, but like, I think they see him as these two guys are the face of Kevin Durant leaving. Right. And like, that is worth something to them organizationally. It's like, this is who came back in addition to whatever they get in the draft. These are the two guys that came back for Kevin Durant. That is really important as a a forward facing piece of the team to, to, to recognize that and to say, we want to retain that because this mm-hmm. is what, and and like, and if we can get the better of this deal, they've already got like a good side of this deal because bridges was just so good. <laughs> so like, I think bridges alone makes the deal fine. But um, if you can have these two guys, like if you can show long-term support and long-term right. buy-in and stuff like that, then it makes the deal look even better. Right. For Kevin Durant. So I actually think those two pieces are, really important for how the nets do you agree with that like how the nets sort of view these two guys i mean the way it's being put in the media i mean like that's this seems like so crystal clear that this is how it's viewed and and it's it, it's it's funny because this is what they wanted kevin durant and kyrie irving and then for a brief moment james harden to be they yeah. they wanted these superstar players to be representative of their organization representative of the brooklyn nets and bringing championships the expectation level has dropped considerably. We know that. But in Mikhail Bridges and, and Cameron Johnson, and I, I believe in Nicholas Claxton as well, the organization is saying, yes, what our goals are have changed, right? The timeline has shifted. But what we wanted from the faces of our organization, that's what we think we now have. And I know the wins and losses are what matters most, but this is an incredibly important piece for an organization that feels like was and justifiably was dragged through the ringer from a media and PR perspective over how things went, right? So no, these are not Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, but guess what? They're not them in other ways, personality, demeanor, and approach to representing an organization, right? And that's not, I'm not even knocking Kevin Durant or Kyrie Irving. They're in a different stratosphere of player. These guys are in maybe the right timeline and the right growth trajectory to be able to represent the organization the way they want and still give fans something to be excited about, if not championship caliber teams. Okay, so with that being said, let's flip over to the other side because there are here and we'll and, and we'll and we'll kind of make the point about like what we originally stated was like why you don't go all the way there. I think we've said at least from an off court stuff, it's all it all che- it checks all the boxes. It does that shouldn't mean everything, but it definitely means something, right? Um, and there is definitely some on court stuff that that helps Johnson too. But I'm going to start with one number that I think is the most important, really, to kind of come out of the box with. Cameron Johnson is like not exactly young. <laughs> he's 27 years old now. Um, it maybe feels like he's younger because he has not been in the NBA very long, but that's because he was basically in college for five years. And so he's entering this contract piece here as a 27 year old, which for a lot of guys along this same timeline is much later, <laughs> like much, mm-hmm. much like years. And I mean, he's older than Jason Tatum, you know, like just as like comparisons, like and I'm not putting him in the same level, but just to start thinking about where these guys are in terms of age curves. Like he's just a lot older than, than a lot of other guys that you would, that have been in the league longer and have like done a lot better. Again, I'm not comparing them. Like he's older than Jalen Brown. <laughs> like just thinking about guys that are still like in, in the playoffs here playing at high yeah. levels. The, a four-year contract would take him into his age 31 season. I mean, that's just getting old. <laughs> now, does he have the same kind of miles on as some of these other guys? No, because he wasn't in the league as long. And he didn't, you know, he redshirted one year in college and he transferred. You know what I mean? So like, the miles aren't necessarily there, but he's not exactly a spring chicken when you're thinking around these contract timelines. And I think that is like a pretty major consideration just on a high level that sometimes gets thrown under thrown away because you're like, ah, oh, it's like his fourth season or whatever, you know, or, right. He just finished his fourth season. He's young. He's not young. <laughs> like he's just not a young guy. Bridges to some degrees along the same way, but Bridges is just a better player. Does that worry you at all? Just to start like just the age. Four year contract, 20 plus million a year. We're looking at 31 year old Cameron Johnson. Like, that's getting up there. And if you're like in non superstar, non superstar age curves. Yeah. It, it, it's not not a concern. <laughs> I'll put it that way. But if the, if the idea is that the prime of an NBA player's career, now maybe Cameron Johnson is a little bit skewed here with everything you brought up, 
But the prime is, you know, it's it's in that 27, 28 to 30, 31, 32 kind of range. Superstars completely blow these curves out of the water. We, we know that. But so, like, if I'm going to maybe overpay, and I think that we're about to catch the prime of Johnson's career, whatever that is, I think I'm like, I'm comfortable with that. And I'm probably comfortable with it because, again, the Mikhail Bridges contract lined up as such that you take the swing on this. And then if it doesn't work out or you see the writing on the roll, wall, excuse me, then you can make decisions about not only Cameron Johnson, but about Mikhail Bridges too, right? You give this era of Brooklyn Nets basketball a chance to develop, including with Nick Claxton and what he's going to do and other pieces you add in. If it doesn't, like if it doesn't work out, you can probably move Cam Johnson at 30 years old, going on 31 to a team that needs a perimeter shooter with a little bit of off the dribble upside, or maybe you do want to attach the picks to it, right? Like, I don't feel as restricted by a little bit of an overpay contract up until he's 31 years old. Now, if you told me the next contract after that for Cameron Johnson, that's going to get into weird waters if you're going to pay him three or four years going to 34 and 35 years old. But I think that's part of the reason why these two players made so much sense getting back in the Kevin Durant deal, because you're getting, in theory, the best years that you're ever going to see from them in their careers. The big question now becomes, will Cameron Johnson take this this little tiny step forward in a couple of key areas, not nearly as much as Mikhail. He's not as good as Mikhail, but if he can improve marginally in some spots, then I actually think you do get the right value here going forward. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the stats around Cameron Johnson and some final considerations when thinking about his contract and where that status should end up. We'll talk about that in a second. First, got to make a fast break. The FanDuel through these NBA playoffs coming up on the NBA Finals. Now new customers are going to get a no-sweat first bet up to, wait for it, $1,000. It's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Look, right now, if you've been rolling with the Miami Heat through the playoffs here, I think they're 10-4 and four against the spread the, <laughs> so far during these playoffs. If you're listening to the podcast here Wednesday morning, Celtics minus seven and a half going into this game. Very difficult situation to know where to land with this thing. One of the most confusing playoffs ever, but you can get your hands on it by going over to FanDuel right now, grabbing that no sweat first bet. It's America's number one sports book. You visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Okay, so before we give our final verdict, which I think will involve what they should do and what we think they will do, what are the stats around Cameron Johnson that I think, I'm, I'm, I'm only assuming here, are going to suggest that he's not worth the 25 ish million dollars a year? Okay, the first stat that's most troubling is the three-point shooting really fell off. Like this year, he was 45% in Phoenix. Maybe that's a super run hot, but he was over 40% for his career. It drops down to 37% as the as the looks go up like right the attempts go up and the and the and the number drops like he was sitting in elite through while within while in phoenix but again that was like just you know catch and shoot chris paul you know like you know good floor spacing they had right. a great pick and roll with him and with, with paul and eaton and you know and booker kind of taking a lot of the defensive attention and now all of a sudden he gets to brooklyn and the shots get harder and the and the percentage drops right like i think you i think that's fair to see like i think it's obvious that that would kind of happen but mm -hmm. he shot worse in philly or sorry philly geez. he shot worse against philly during the playoffs and then during and then during the regular season than he had ever done in phoenix and that's like a little bit of a concern because if you get down to 37 percent, it's like oh are we in elite three-point territory ah uh, no <laughs> you know <laughs> like on all of a sudden and that's kind of like what you're banking on from him to if you're starting to sign him for for big numbers is like that the three-point shooting is going to be completely lights out and you're going to also see other growth in his game. Now, I think there was a little growth in his game just in terms of on ball stuff. The overall field goal percentage did go up. So he actually mm -hmm. shot better from overall from the field, just worse from three. You would rather see that. But I guess what, what you're saying here is if you're signing to this number, he's kind of got to be both, <laughs> right? Like he's got to, the, the game has to expand and the three point shooting still needs to live in that 40% range. And if it's not going to be there, you're I think you're putting in yourself in like a tricky territory with that number. So that's that's step one. And like and honestly, it's funny because this goes into like deeper nets problems that like Houston might not have. Like if Houston signs James Harden, they have a floor facilitator that like works great with um with spacing and pick and roll. Mm -hmm. Like then those like a Cameron Johnson would actually just see a lot better shots, right? 
right. way the Nets are currently constructed with like, you know, maybe not a super high end point guard and like the shots might not ever get better. And so I just, this is where you get, this is where you, it's a tricky situation with the number because it's like at that number, he kind of has to be pretty great. <laughs> and, but if the Nets aren't going to have a system that makes him be that, that is able to facilitate that, then it's, then it's tricky. I have some pro CJ stuff, but what do you think about that? Yeah, and I think, you know, it's funny just mentioning that coming up here, if not this week, probably next week at some point, we're going to discuss how do the Brooklyn Nets improve their table setter, their point guard position on yeah. this roster, right? Some of these things, the production of certain players, role guys, et cetera, is going to be impacted by the draft and by the free agent market. The Nets have some money to work with with TPEs and MLEs, right? So now, can that justify the contract you pay Cameron Johnson because you're going to bring in a guy that's going to set him up? No, I think you have to feel comfortable about what he can do unto himself. And, and the numbers are, they're, I would say they are a little bit concerning. He played five more minutes coming over from Phoenix, took a couple more shots per game. You mentioned the overall field goal percentage goes up. I like the fact that the free throws also went up, right? He got there three and a half times per game with the Nets. The free throw shooting went up. So I, I think my question becomes, are the other parts of his game capable of being, being looked at and leaned in more heavily to? Because to your point, you may have to accept that he can't just be that guy that spaces the floor and knocks down triples because if that's the premise and you pay him the contract, I think you could be looking back regretting it potentially a year or two into it. Whereas if you think the overall all-around game can get there, then you then you paint a guy that's just a, a solid contributor in all phases, and that includes the defensive end of the court as well. Yeah, and that's, again, what you're kind of hoping on here. Like, you're hoping for the the, the curve still is on the graph is still on the way up. You hope that, like, his game, just because, like, what we saw with Bridges, like, there just hasn't been a chance for expansion because of those mm -hmm. aforementioned Chris Paul and Devin Booker and guys are going to control the ball a lot, right? Like, you just hope, and you hope that's going to be the case, and then you hope the defense translates. There are advanced stats that actually do really help him here, like estimated box, or, uh, EPMs, actually estimated plus minus. He ranks really high. Like, he's in the same range as, like, Aaron Gordon. I mean, like John Morant, Desmond Bain, right? Like Fred Van Vliet, like guys, this is from dunks and threes. Like, you know, like these, these numbers can get a little wonky and like, in terms of like your specifically defense is pretty tough. Um, I think to really hammer home on, but like that's his offensive box and defensive box plus minus is good too. Like his overall BPM puts him top 50 in the league or somewhere like that. Right. Like he's ahead of, yeah. you know, a few of the point guards you like, like in terms of Darren Fox and, Fred Van Vliet is behind uh, Triple J. He's behind uh, Paul George. So some of this is cumulative. So, like, that actually helps Cameron Johnson because his minutes weren't as high as some of these other guys. Like, I think there are advanced stats that do help the case here. Um, and maybe that's what you want to sort of lean on with the contract is like, hey, the game hasn't been fully unlocked. There's some there's um, analytics that really back up that the game is actually – much better than some of the things that you might even see in the box score. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that is a good thing overall. I do sometimes wonder about like how, if these things are like rated correctly, or if like, if this is still the right move, just because it's like, Hey, it's a lot of money for a team that's not going to win the championship. And like, sort of, what are we doing here? But, um, and I, and, but I get, and maybe that's maybe that's enough to like kind of put me down the middle on it, but I don't know. So when you think about those numbers, like does that back up the eye test for what you saw from him? Yeah, I'll, I'll close out on this. And you mentioned, you know, which way do we really land on this thing? Remember, three out of the four games against Philadelphia, they were swept. We understand that, but Mikhail Bridges as well had some really great performances. Three out of the four games for Cameron Johnson check the box for me, right? He did the things from a shooting perspective. He was able to impact the game. There's even those little moments down the stretch of the season and into that playoff series where Cam Johnson took some guys off the dribble and got at the rim with some physicality. He went, oh, okay. Like those aren't things you necessarily associate with them. And maybe that area of his game can grow. You mentioned about, you know, for a team that's not going to win a championship, not spending big money like this on a player that might be marginal in terms of his real value. The, the two things on that are one, and this is a Doug Norrieism. Only one team's happy at by the end of the season, the team that wins the championship. And you got to spend the money has to get spent and you need to try to be not the Orlando magic for years or, you know, not the dumpster, not the Houston Rockets for years. You want to be a competitive team. You have to spend that money somewhere. I'm going to land on the fact that I think there is a little bit more growth here for Cameron Johnson in an expanded role. 
the the uh, the absolute disaster you know basement floor would be he's joe johnson uh joe had joe johnson I wish he had joe johnson joe harris and he you know three-point shooting or bust and then nothing but he's more athletic he's more dynamic so that's not the case i'm gonna believe there's a little more growth here for cameron johnson that the value is relatively right on the contract and the only thing that would give me pause is if somebody really comes in laying the hammer and i'm talking about clearing a hundred million on this contract and, and and a team could do that but I, it'd be bad practice by another franchise, which is why I think the number stays close enough. And frankly, why there's even the world where Cameron Johnson just comes back and, and looks with the Nets. It may not even get to this point. Sorry, I, I, I rambled here for a second to get to this. It may not get to him getting to the market. The Brooklyn Nets can talk with him, negotiate with him, and get the extension contract signed before he even goes to market. That's the way that you avoid the massive overpay is you go to him and say, escalating deals starting at 20 and going up to 28 by the end of whatever you want it to be, right? Put the numbers in place that make sense for you. You get that deal done. You don't have to worry about Houston giving some albatross contract that you don't want to have to match. Yeah, RFA stuff gets really tricky because of the timing with it too. So like sometimes teams yeah. are incentivized to just avoid it because it like, it, it, it's, it's tough for both. Buys up your money like, somewhere else and you can't go spend it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it puts everyone in a tricky bind. Anyway, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. I, I you know, I think that I'm, I'm, I think we definitely land in the like. There's a number that's too much. Um, and we'd love to see Cameron Johnson back at the right number because I think that is a floor raiser for your team overall. Listen, we are gonna do um a mailbag here getting into the end of the oh, week. Right. If you have questions, if you have questions that you want to see us answer, we've already got a ton in the hopper. We might end up doing two mailbags just because we have a lot here. Um. But throw them in the YouTube comments. Uh, put a question in there. We read every comment, so don't worry about that. Put a question in, and we'll bring some of these questions live up on the show to answer about Nets offseason stuff, Nets draft stuff. You know, anything, everything is fair game. So make sure you throw it in there. Uh, we'll be doing a mailbag uh, later this week, and maybe even ne into next week as well. Hey, things are never that scary when you have a best friend. That's Calvin from Calvin and Hobbs. Oh, one of the all-time great poets. We'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.